Hi, I'm Jewel Parker Rhodes, author of the book, Porch Stories, A Grandmother's Guide to Happiness. Welcome to Literary Living. Hi, I'm Heather Covington and welcome to Literary Living. We have a very interesting show for you today. But first, I'd like to introduce you to my guest announcer, Ezra Knight. Hey Heather, how are you? Thank you, I'm feeling great Ezra. Can you tell us who's on the show today? Today we have a special guest, legendary singer and songwriter, Ms. Roberta Flack. Leela James, singer, songwriter, and activist. Ms. Ruby D. Actress of stage and screen, poetress and author, Jewel Parker Rhodes, professor and author. Hi, I'm Dara Frazier for Literary Living. I'm joined by Miss Ruby D. It's a pleasure to have you on our show. Welcome. How are you today? Just fine, just fine. Tell us a little bit about your participation in today's Up South events. Well, I'm, I'm delighted and I was very excited because I love the idea of writers coming together across the globe and exchanging ideas on so many of the things that we have in common, you know, and, and as, well as, uh, the, as well as showing how connected we are in terms of our specifics, you understand? Like, like the... Um, the, the, the author who read tonight is showing how off we, we're, we're so more, we're more like each other than we suspect. We are each other in, in, a, in, a, in an enormously uh, fundamental, in enormously fundamental ways. Thank you for sharing with us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Coming up, Jewel Parker Rhodes, professor and author. Hi, I'm Thomas Matthews. I'm here with Jewel Parker Rhodes. How are you doing, Ms. Parker? I'm fine. Thank you, Thomas. Now, what brings you here? I came for the Up South International Conference, and I did a reading this evening with Ms. Ruby Day, of oh. which I'm very proud right. to be a part of that evening. Right. But I wrote a book called Porch Stories, A Grandmother's Guide to Happiness. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, it's based on stories that my grandmother told me about how to live a good life. So, you know, wear clean underwear, <laughs> or that tale where um, if a bird catches up your hair and uses it for its nest, then your hair is going to fall right out, or she'd say do good and fly right back to you. So it's a series of stories sitting on the porch uh, that she told me, and I'm trying to tell readers so they can feel the spirit of my grandmother and her oral tales and perhaps feel better connected to their literary tradition. But telling stories and writing it down, if I didn't write it down, then everybody else would know about it. So there is that transition from oral tradition to written tradition and how we need to celebrate the fact that we're in another renaissance of, of writers because it does last another way. It lasts in a longer, it's in an archive of a library. And sometimes it seems to me that we don't then take our grandparents' voices or our parents' voices or our elders' voices. And I'd say, if you're afraid to write them down, then just turn on a tape recorder. We can hold all that legacy in. It's a wonderful book. Um, it just came out, um, and one of the things that's really special is that my grandmother, in telling stories, I like to say to people that she gave me my profession, right. and she also gave me my values. And my grandmother died at 52, much too young, over 30 years ago, right. and the book is now coming out on the my age at 52, and I feel it's kind of interesting that now I get to live a longer, healthier storytelling life right. because of my grandmother, and I miss her every day, but she really saved my life. And we forget the power of stories in our tradition and our culture. And in the back of the book, there's a section where people can write their own stories. And if you don't have a grandmother, you can write about an elder, some other ancestor, and write those stories down and pass them along because they'll last a lot longer. 
I teach uh, in the graduate creative writing program and I teach uh, people who want to be novelists how to write a novel. So it's a wonderful program but I also run a conference and we do a lot of work with outreach to the schools. We give scholarships to teenagers, high school students, undergraduates who can come to the conference. So I'm all about teaching more and more people how to write. We're going to have wonderful Walter Mosley this year and so we're going to show Deb in a blue dress and then have Walter Mosley do a reading from his work. So we bring on all kinds of authors and for me like I didn't even know that black people wrote books till I was a junior in college. Really? Literally, oh. literally. Though even though my grandmother was a storyteller and all the folks told stories, the idea of being a writer was foreign to me. Right. So one day I walked in the library and I saw this wonderful book called Corregidor by Gail Jones and I read this book and I said, oh, I'm going to do that. I'm going to be a, be a writer and I switched my major and I've been writing ever since. So I often felt that had I seen writers of color, uh, I might have started earlier. Or the idea that there was prejudice and discrimination, so even though as a child I wrote lots of stories. Like I wrote a story in the third grade called The Last Scream. And I remember the teachers taking me around to different classes so I could read my last scream. <laughs> but none of the educators who were really all white ever said to me, you can be a writer. Right. So I'm on a mission uh, to encourage young people to write, to be a writer, so they don't have to wait until they're a junior in college to start. Right, yeah. okay. Um, would you say any last words to any any young person who's trying to be a writer, any advice, any anything? The best advice is to one, to believe in yourself. And in writing, you actually are making yourself more you. That you're articulating your thoughts, your feelings, your ideas. And that's a glorious thing. So if you want to be proud of yourself, right? All you have to do is keep writing and you'll have a long journey in which you celebrate yourself, become more yourself, and you get to share it with the world. What's better? Coming up next, Leela James. pride ourselves in being the nation's largest African-American self-help publishing company. We try very hard to provide the community with books that can empower and show us the direction we may want to pursue in life. Amber Books, the nation's largest African-American self-help publishing company. To order, call We pride ourselves in being the nation's largest African-American self-help publishing company. We try very hard to provide the community with books that can empower and show us the direction we may want to pursue in life. Amber Books, the nation's largest African-American self-help publishing company. To order, call 1-866-566-3144. Coming up next, we have Leela James, singer, songwriter, and activist. I try to, you know, draw from my influences of where I come from. And right. I just come from an environment where I heard a lot of blues, so right. that's what I sing about sometimes as well. Um, how did you get started? I basically was always around music, you know, my family was very musical, singing, um, you know, obviously in the church, sang all the time, so that was probably my beginnings, if you will, but I didn't really begin to actually take it serious from a professional standpoint 
until I got in high school. High school, okay. Yeah. High school with bands and uh -huh. doing a lot of talent shows because I've always been a lover of real music and real instrumentation. Right. And um, I just put together my own band when I got older right. as well. And um, I continue to try to make music the way I feel like music used to be made. Right. You know, yeah. uh, with the real instruments and right. I love performing and right. that's what I'm doing. Right. And when I say get back to music, I mean get back to the kind of music that I felt like was made some 20 years ago, 20, 30 years ago, when you heard various artists like Al Green and Donny Hathaway and Gladys Knight mm -hmm. and Aretha Franklin's and, you know, the, the music I feel like is still relevant today. Right, and right. I don't know if some of the music that I hear today will be relevant 10, 20 years from now. Right. And I, I give tribute and acknowledge the people that I feel like have opened the door and paved the way for artists like myself who, you know, who represent, in my opinion, the truth, the, right. who represent true, um, artistry and, and true musicianship, you know, real singers and making real music and, you know, a lot of the people that I did mention, they're still alive and, mm -hmm. you know, I feel like some of those artists don't get the respect that they deserve, you know, you don't really hear the music on the radio right. as much and they consider old or this played out and I don't agree, I think the music that they made was probably better than a lot of stuff that's out today. I'm definitely inspired by uh, the lyrics that uh, Sam Cooke wrote a lot of and, and a lot of his music, um, especially the song of change is gonna come. Um, I performed that song and uh, um, entitled my album Change is gonna come. I felt like when he wrote the song he was really, you know, believing that change would come and it was written for so many different reasons and it's just it was um, it's impactful. Very strong. I saw that there was a great need for this type of book for the African American community. And that's how How to Be an Entrepreneur really came into being. Um, we as a community need to understand that jobs are not, are not uh, something that we're going to have uh, for the rest of our lives like it used to be a long time ago. Uh, and this is a tool that uh, anyone can use, whether you've been downsized from a corporation, whether this is a lifelong dream. Uh, How to Be an Entrepreneur is written for everyone, for the novice all the way up to the expert. Um, I wrote it in very small uh, digestible chunks of information so that it's easy for anyone. Uh, and I put some stories of my own entrepreneurial activities in here. So this is a book that I'm really extremely proud of, uh, something that anyone can pick up and use. And uh, there's a lot of information in the resources section in the book. So if you ever get lost or need some help, all you have to do is either go sit down at your keyboard and key in some of the uh, resources that I've listed or pick up your telephone and call someone. So uh, how to be an entrepreneur is, is really my baby. I think for anyone wanting to be a poet, or wanting to be a writer, I'll make it even broader than that, wanting to be a writer, want, wanting to be a writer, there is a link between reading and writing that is undeniable. That um, writers, poets, learn how to write from other writers. You know, you learn by reading, and you, find, you learn by reading what, not only what the masses have done, but what the contemporary practitioners are doing. Right. And from that, you get a sense of what, what really constitutes a good poem, what really constitutes good language. And you get a sense of how one forms your own identity for any young person, any, any, anyone contemplating writing or poetry, to really immerse oneself in, in reading.
Wow, what a privilege it is to have you here on Literary Living with us. Thank Welcome, you, Walter. Roberta Flack. Thank you very much. It's nice to be oh, here. We are so happy that you're here with us. And, Thank you. You know, everyone knows you at sight, and then at sound. Oh, wow. <laughs> I think I get more recognition from sound, which for me is a very rewarding kind of uh, moment, you know, to experience because sometimes I'm in a cab or getting on an airline or something, airplane or buying a ticket or anything, you know, asking for a ticket for uh, to see a movie and somebody will look up and say, aren't you? Aren't you? <laughs> aren't you? Could it possibly be? But I, my course. favorite one is, are you who I think you are? And, and I what's go, your response? I, I say, um, if, it, uh, if you think I'm Diana Ross, no. <laughs> <laughs> you're, so, you're too much. You're no. too much. Well, now I know that you have a new album out. Well, I do have a new album out. It's called The Very Best, The Very Best of Roberta Fly. And how on earth does one choose the very best of Well, it's, you know, I thank you for saying that. I, I am not the person to, to choose, that's for sure because I'm probably my worst critic, as most creative people tend to be. Um, but I do like the songs that we selected, and I say we because for once I really got involved in, in the selection of the songs. Um, for instance, um, there, there is a song on there that Stevie Wonder wrote just for me uh, after Donny Hathaway's unfortunate passing. Um, Stevie had written five songs for Donnie and I to record, and Donnie and I only got to do one, You Are My Heaven, you know? And um, then uh, he was gone, God rest his soul. And um, so Stevie wanted to try to, to make sure that You Are My Heaven was really perfect. We, I got on the plane and went out to LA to his studio. And right in the middle of his putting some string parts down, um, he said, he turned to me and said, Roberta, I said, yes, he said, I want to write you a disco smash. Oh my. And I said, when? He said, right now. And I said, wow. So we stopped what we were doing and he sent me back to my hotel. And before that though, he called in his bass player and his um, guitarist and he played drums and he had two guitarists and a bass player and he played drums and keyboards. Mm -hmm. And I, I heard what he was writing and he would say, sing this, and da 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 And I sang it, da 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 And I sang it and he said, that's perfect, that's the right key and everything. And so we went, um, I went back to the hotel and he called me the next morning about 5.30, quarter six. He said, your car is downstairs. He had been working on it all night. And when I got back to the studio, I listened to the track and then we sang it and it was great. And the song is called Don't Make Me Wait Too Long. Don't make me wait. And Stevie is actually singing with me. He doesn't sing with me, he, we do a little rap. He says, um, you know I believe in you. I don't mind what you do, but please don't make me wait on my stuff too long. Oh, great. <laughs> Are there any popular authors that you? I like Maya Angelou, enjoy? everything that Maya, um, has done. I find myself going back again and again to I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings because oh, she's a beautiful. personal friend of mine. And she's written uh, recently a book called Hallelujah Kitchen, I think. But it's about food and she tells stories about, um, you know, how she got to be such a great cook and she is a great cook. And the, the reason I'm attracted to that book uh, as opposed to some of the other books that I have in my uh, face in my in my apartment is because I'm from the south and she's from uh, the south too or from the, that part of the of the this country where cooking not just soul food but where cooking was uh, not not only an art but it was a passage you know you had to learn yes, how to cook you had to, you had to. it yes. wasn't like a, a doubt. do you choose so it's interesting to read her uh, uh, stories that she can associate with uh, learning how to cook certain foods and and what it means and stuff like that. I like that book a lot. And, Do you um, have another? Well, there, there is um, a book that I've, I have started to read three times and I gave it away each time and I'm waiting now. That's interesting. For the hard. You start it and then you give what? it away before you finish it or? Yeah, because oh. I like t telling people about it. It's called okay. Christ Out of Egypt. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, I didn't buy it because of the religious uh, um, subject or because it was talking about. But because it was written by, written by uh, the late same person who wrote Interview with a Vampire, Anne Rice. Anne Rice. And she, her story was, in writing this book, and I saw it on TV, you know, in some, some
um, interview was, she was um, responding to, mm -hmm. and she was talking about how she changed her mind from all of those negative, evil things she was thinking that brought her to write about vampires and, and things that happen to you and stuff like that living in New Orleans and um, being there for so many years. Certain things happened to her in her life, which I will not relate. She tells you about it in the book. And it's, for me, it was hard just to get past her explanation of why she went from writing about vampires, vampires into and devils to writing about Christ as a real person. And yeah. what she does in the book is she, she imagines Christ based on her understanding and because, you know, it's almost like she got, in our, my church we would say she got the Spirit. Mm. She got the Holy Ghost. Yes. Once she got that, it seems that she could not stop talking about it. And so instead of saying, I feel like I want to shout, yeah. she started shouting it through her ability to be, be so um, literarily interesting, you know, just so interesting. And she actually gives you a picture of Jesus as a little boy which I have never found any other uh, information that backs this up, but in her book, he is a little boy, and he's like five or six years old, and he has friends in the village where all of he and all of his Jewish friends live. He doesn't realize that he's the son of God, and his father, Joseph, does you know miraculous job of keeping that from him. One day, he has an argument with a friend of his, a little friend of his, and he pushes the little boy, and the little boy falls, and he's dying. Oh my goodness. Oh. And, he, and Jesus doesn't know, that this is Anne Rice now, Jesus doesn't know why you know this is all happening. And so finally they talk, the elders talk, and they decide not to tell Jesus you know, that he is the son of God. They know, all know this, all of his relatives. But they say, you have to go next door and visit your friend and tell him that you want him to get up, you want him to be well, okay? And so he goes next door and he says, I'm sorry I hit you. You can get up now and be well. And the little boy says, okay. You see, all when I read again. that, I was like, wow. okay, I think I'll read this book. Wow. And so I bought it like two or three times. I sent it to Hawaii, I sent it to California, and I gave it to another very dear friend of mine here in New York. And then when I went to look for it about a month ago, it's out of the hard copy print, and mm. it's where they're waiting for the soft cover print. So I, that's my favorite book of late. Wow. Well, I hope that you're able to finish that book. I'm One day to. real soon. I'm going to. <laughs> because it sounds to me like an extraordinary story. Well, we thank you so much. Roberta thank you. Black for joining us on Literary Living. Thank you very much. <laughs>
And now, more inspirational words from George C. Frazier. I also know, as you know, that if everything happens for a reason and serves us in some special way, and we will never understand that reason looking forward, and we will only understand it looking backward, the great Carl Jung called this synchronicity, the seemingly accidental intermeshing of meaningless circumstances. And what he discovered in life's work is that there are no meaningless circumstances, that everything happens for a reason. So if everything happens for a reason, maybe we were not brought here. Maybe we were sent here. Do you believe that God would put his weakest people here to do his toughest job? I don't think so. We also know, Dr. Reynolds, that when life is not fair, we must make sense out of our suffering, right? How could America morally and spiritually justify the kidnapping, raping, and pillaging and enslaving of another people for 250 years have any moral or spiritual grounding? So it was black people in America who said and insisted that America not settle for anything less than moral and spiritual greatness. Perhaps we were not brought here, we were sent here. And had we not been sent here, America would have self-destructed by now. We are an awesome people and our leaders understand who we are. Our leaders also understand that success runs in our race. I mean, this is not some hype. hype. Our leaders understand that we are a $790 billion annual economy. If we were a nation, we would be the 10th richest nation in the entire world. Let me dimensionalize $790 billion for you by the end of this year. You can take the 50 plus countries on the continent of Africa, combine their gross national product, and it would not equal the 790 billion that we bring to the table in a single year in America. You could then take the 13 countries in the Caribbean, combine their gross national product, add it to the continent of Africa, and it would not equal the 790 billion that we bring to the table in a single year. 